Uh, this morning we have um, uh, some amazing track leads. I'd like to introduce uh, Shrilal, uh, who's a consultant paediatrician, and he's in charge of the paediatric and neonatal uh, intensive care unit at the Lady Ridgeway Hospital, which many of you visited yesterday. Um, He's the first uh, paediatrician in the country to take up um, intensive care full time. And he's also the current president of the society that we're um, co-chairing this uh, meeting with the uh, Sri Lankan Society for Critical Care and Emergency Medicine. Uh, and he is also the immediate past president of the Sri Lankan College of Paediatricians. Uh, he's been involved in the development of this conference right from the outset. And it's a very great honor to have him on our faculty uh, Natalie uh, is uh, an emergency physician from Sydney and um, she'll soon be working in our shop as well down at Wollongong, which is great. Uh, she trained in the UK and Australia and she spent considerable time working with um, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, on especially the Zamfara lead poisoning disaster in northern Nigeria and has been a team leader during multiple missions. Uh, most recently, she's just returned from the Syrian border and we're very glad to have her back safe and sound from that important but fairly precarious work. Um, she's worked with us in developing M for a number of years and it's really great to have her back on the team again. Uh, together, they've put together an outstanding group and I, I think I've got everyone's photos, but there might be a couple missing. Um, and it's a really international group from not only this region but from around the world um, here to tell us about their experiences in developing emergency medicine. Um, so I'll hand over to Nat and Shrilal and give them a big hand for organising a team from about seven different countries. Thanks very much, um, Mark, and, and thank you to you, Sanj and Lee, for, for um, allowing us to um, lead this session. Um, as Mark said, we've got um, a really wide range of uh, interesting and I hope provocative presentations about um, emergency medicine and medicine in conflict uh, around the world. So um, without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Sralal to introduce our first speaker. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I have pleasure of in my, uh, introducing um, Dr. Danapalo Rodrigo. Uh, he's, uh, he's graduated from Sri Lanka, Peradeniya, and he worked here for a few years and then moved to United States to do uh, anesthesia. So he practiced in the U.S. as a fellow in pediatric anesthesia from 1973. Then um, he developed interest in developing the emergency medicine and the ETU concept in Sri Lanka. So he has been traveling to Sri Lanka from 1993, almost at regular intervals, in trying to establish um, uh, emergency units uh, in various parts of the Sri Lanka. Uh, so he has faced many challenges, which he's going to tell us. And also he has published a book uh, called Unfinished Journey uh, with, his, all its, with all its experience. Um, he has been honored by the Kandy Society of Medicine for his excellent work. And he's also, uh, is, is a, he has a passion in, for painting, and he, he has made nice uh, paintings uh, and so far. Probably he has got a bit touch on that as well. So it's so to Dhanapala for your talk. all of you. Um, I'm not an emergency physician, so don't expect too much from me. I'm just an <laughs> anesthetist. And somehow I got dragged into this, and I want to share that story with you. Uh, in this process, I will have to wash some dirty linen, but I will let you know when I'm going to do that. And uh, a friend of mine died in 1991. Uh, uh, he had the surgery in a premier hospital in the country. He came to the recovery room, <coughs> recovered fully. OK. 
Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Uh, he came to the recovery room. He recovered fully. <laughs> then he was taken to the ward, and by that time he was dead. So what is my connection? He was in the uh, he was in Los Angeles, and just before he uh, uh, left Los Angeles, he asked me, "I have to have this surgery done." Shall I go to Sri Lanka and have it done? I said, sure, you go to Sri Lanka and you'll be well taken care of. So this death rattled me and prompted me to come to Sri Lanka and see if there's anything I could do to help the country. Oh, sorry. Um, this is the book I published. I'm, uh, I, have to, I will go to the next slide and tell you why I... Uh, uh, here we are. I want to read this dedication. Dedicated to those who join my struggle to make a tiny difference in the lives of those who have no voice. I decided on a mid-size hospital, uh, and I didn't know anyone uh, in the hospital. Now, here is a guy who left the country uh, for an affluent uh, place, and now coming back to show them how to run the show. It won't be a pretty sight. So realizing the sensitivity of the situation, a batchmate of mine who was a private practitioner, he organized a party and uh, I was invited and we had a very good time. Uh, pointer? Yeah. Sure. Oh, okay. Here the observation, surgeon, and here I'm trying to fiddle with the guitar myself. Yeah. And uh, when I went, you know, these are little tricks, really. You had to become friendly with the staff before trying to do anything. So when I went to the hospital the following day, I was received very warmly. This was the status of CPR in 1993. Nurses had not seen embu bags, let alone trying to resuscitate someone. So I checked with a couple of nursing schools, uh, and they said, no, they don't uh, teach CPR, they don't even have mannequins. Then I realized, hey, there is something I could do. Uh, I came back in six months' time uh, uh, with a bro broken mannequin, going from hospital to hospital and uh, a nursing school to nursing school. Very soon, the anesthetists took over from me, and they were really very grateful to me. And I bought 11 mannequins from Norway and shipped them to uh, uh, Sri Lanka and uh, distributed them among all the nursing schools. They don't have any fancy features and all, uh, things like lights and stuff like, but the basic thing, but they did the work. Okay. Here comes the dirty linen. Uh, this saw the situation in the wards. Uh, uh, at least one third, one third of the patients did not have beds. They are called flow patients. Look at this, how dirty it is and how can anyone maintain sanity? How can anyone work here in a situation like that? But this was there from the time I could remember. Um, then, if they have to go to a clinic, I'm sorry to say this, but that was the real situation. That is why I am here. They go the, the previous evening uh, to the hospital and try to sleep somewhere in a corridor outside and then join a huge queue uh, to get a number. And look at this, the only person having a smile is this my name. Oh. Well, I don't know. Anyway, uh, look at the sad faces throughout. Um, then um, I want to say a word about uh, this section of our society. Um, this section, they suffer in silence. They have no voice. And they have no connections. If they get a backache, they don't have the capability of booking a flight to Singapore. Uh, if I, uh, the, the only way I can describe is they are the children of a lesser God. Uh, then I wondered, is there anything I could do to help this section? That is why I am here. Uh, so I thought that if I could do anything, anything at all, that would be the most worthwhile thing I'd be doing in my life. So 
I identified the two issues, the, the, the flow of patients and the queues. Uh, so uh, first I wanted to tackle the, the, uh, the flow of patients. So I went and sat with the uh, outpatient uh, admitting doctor. Anyone can get admitted, no questions asked. They are not evaluated. And what about the emergencies? No, they couldn't tackle, actually they shouldn't have tackled too. Uh, all of them get admitted. And um, then no resuscitation at the point of uh, entry. So they were introducing things called emergency treatment units, ETUs. I visited three of them, uh, but they didn't tackle emergencies. Actually, they shouldn't have, they couldn't, one person. Uh, then I asked, what do you do here? Oh, we occasionally we nebulize a patient. So actually they were glorified nebulizing centers. Um, I want to say a word about, I don't know, our culture or our nation, whatever. Since we got the independence, at least, not much change. That inner drive to, to go forward, uh, that restlessness, come on, let us make tomorrow better. It is not there. I don't know what caused that. Is it our culture or is it the government structure? I don't know. Then I thought the first thing to do is to have a screening center at the point of entry. Then when I thought about that, I realized that it's very much like the American emergency rooms, which I was familiar with. Um, here we are. I selected this slide for a particular reason. When I come here, I listen to many speeches, and my jaw drops. Uh, mesmerizing speeches, I wish I could talk like that. And, but at the end, nothing happens. They are called NATO members. No action, talk only. <laughs> uh, so, since I'm not a good talker, I decided on doing something. I wrote a proposal to the, uh, uh, to the director general or whoever, and sent it to the ministry, proposal for an emergency room for that particular, particular hospital, and then went to the ministry in about four to five months' time with two of my medical school friends. Uh, I mean, they, were in, they were professors and one of the president of the anesthesia society or something like that. But then I noticed a subtle hostility towards me. Uh, slowly, the atmosphere was getting hostile, and this is the letter I received from my professor friend. I read the last sentence. I am very sad and hurt the way they treated you. So, stage was well set for me to quit. I called the ambassador, Dr. Jayanta Danapala, uh, uh, and I told him. I had not met him, but I had uh, spoken to him. I said, I couldn't proceed anymore. He sympathized with me and said, Doctor, if that's the way you feel, that's okay. And then uh, in about three days' time, he called me back and said, Doctor, you cannot say you cannot go. You have to go because I know one day you will make a difference. Write me a letter why you cannot go. So I wrote a scathing letter. And again, in about three days' time, he called me and asked me to see a particular presidential advisor in my next visit. And I did that. And even before I left the country, they issued a memorandum to, to the foreign missions. Um, how to help the expatriates or something like that. But they told me that was really for me to continue my work. Uh, Dr. Danapala is a true diplomat, a true son of Sri Lanka. If he didn't intervene that day, you wouldn't be here today. Now, how to introduce a change? I, and I haven't done anything like that, and there are no cookbooks to follow. And. Uh, I had to develop something from nothing. People didn't even know how to ventilate the patient, so I have to bring it from there. Uh, how do I do that? Maybe go to the head office and talk to those guys, and everyone told me, oh, that's a non-start. So I had to develop something in the periphery. Um, for a man who had nothing in his hands, these quotes really, really inspired me. This uh, uh, American general who fought the, the World War II. Uh, and these are the people who propelled our, our world to a better place. A good plan executed right now is better than a perfect plan executed next week. Uh, I can understand that now because that, that next week with the perfect plan never comes. Hmm? 
do what you can where you are with what you got. Uh, I can understand these things now, really. And what, what if you make mistakes? The only person who does not make a mistake is the person who never does anything. Hey, I got fired up now. If those guys can do with their limited resources, I also can do. So I decided, uh, uh, I decided to start. So this is how I started my first emergency room in the country. Uh, and I want to share that story with you. I took all the outpatient doctors and the consultants to lunch and gave them alcohol first. <laughs> and uh, Actually, I realized that alcohol has a little motivating effect. <laughs> and, uh, at the end of lunch, I declared my intention, say, buddy, come on, let us develop this one. Everyone, 100 percent, wanted to support me. <laughs> but unfortunately, I couldn't get the space, and nothing happened for one and a half years. Uh, whatever I did from then onwards was totally unorthodox. Uh, the fact that I'm standing here shows you that I have been successful. But the road, but the road to success had many roadblocks, speed bumps, and potholes. But I think above all, I think I have been immensely lucky. In 1995, that particular hospital was going through some renovations uh, and they had these condemned items. So whatever they were shifting places at one stage, they were at a tiny ward at the entrance of the hospital. My lucky break. So I called the surgeon, sadly he's no more with us. He passed away about two years ago, Dr. Lirakna Veerathinga. I said that. Uh, we are, can you give that word to me? I want to try out my emergency room experiment. For a few days, can you give it to me? He said, yeah, take it. So I packed my bags, came to Sri Lanka, and the staff helped me to clear part of the ward. Uh, and they didn't know what I was going to do, but knew whatever it was, it was going to be radical. So November 26th, 1995. I started the unit with, I had only four beds and uh, two doctors and uh, uh, two doctors, two nurses and one mine employee and we ran only for four hours that day. We couldn't get any nurses uh, to run it. Uh, the doctors were cooperative, a little bit trusty, uh, not to the level of emergency doctors. They were just outpatient uh, physicians. Uh, but I tell you, the day ended up in utter confusion. They were wondering why I'm trying to admit these guys rather than admitting them to the hospital and let them take care of them. Um, I had some problems myself. Since I was an anesthesiologist uh, uh, for 20 odd years, whatever, I had not evaluated patients or treated. So I had no clinical sense and my medical knowledge also had evaporated. Yeah. And uh, that evening really, I wondered why I undertook a huge mission like this. But then I realized everyone was looking up to me. I had burned all the bridges behind me. There was only one way to go, go forward. Slowly, things got better. The number of beds, think, they didn't get better in a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. Uh, uh, number of beds increased to eight. They got the night coverage slowly again. 8 to 12, 8 to 2, 8 to 4, you know, like that. And uh, it was a difficult time. Some consultants were openly against that, openly. It was wrong if they started an IV. It was wrong if they did not start an IV. How can I ever thank these young doctors adequately who work under tremendous pressure? You see, I'm not there all the time. I was working in states those days. So somehow they weathered all these things and uh, uh, to see where we are today. Now I have something. Hey, I can talk about this. So I started from southern tip Hambantota to northern tip uh, 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 Jaffna, visited hospitals, and started talking about this emergency care. But no one wanted to listen to me for some reason. And they got irritated too. Then I had one of my batchmates, Dr. Ganesha Ratnam, a surgeon in the National Hospital, he said, don't call it emergency. They are confused with that emergency treatment unit. Invent a name having that emergency part. So I invented this name, preliminary care unit. You give the first line of treatment regardless of the condition. 
So then people started listening to me to see what the hell it is. Now I like to think my time is limited. I like to fast forward 10 years. There are a lot of activities between 1995 uh, and 2005. I accepted any place to develop a unit, like abandoned uh, ward, a couple of rooms, uh, or corridor, like Nuareli and Peradeniya, my medical school started in the corridor, and it is still in the corridor. And uh, some, uh, and I developed about 12 units, and since 1993, I visited the country twice a year, without fail, just to promote this emergency care uh, and family medicine too. Uh, towards 2005, dedicated structures started appearing. Now this one is home agama. Uh, uh, I think I started it in uh, 2004, the, the, the resuscitation area. Uh, I learned, I made mistakes, I learned from my mistakes. And uh, I started reading journals, and especially the case reports. And I matured and evolved with every center. I regained my confidence, uh, and I got my clinical touch back. Uh, so this is the observation area of uh, Homagam Hospital, uh, observation area of the uh, emergency unit. Now, I want to show you the ward. ward. Two days after starting the emergency room, now this particular ward had over 70 patients. Look at it now, maybe five patients. Now the problem is we have more nurses than patients in the ward. <laughs> Actually, the physician came to me and said, at this rate, I will not have any patients for my interns. <laughs> now, I, uh, here we are. Uh, during this time, just to uh, promote this concept, to get uh, their support, I visited parliamentarians, ministers, uh, and I learned a lot about how a government and a ministry function, not what you see on the TV or what you read on the newspaper, what really happened behind the screen. And I also learned a lot about human nature. Things I wouldn't have known if I didn't go through this process. How kind the human beings are and how cruel they are at times. One Mr. Bradman Viracon, he was the secret secretary to the present prime minister at that time, I think about 2004. Uh, he had been the secretary to all the state leaders for half a century. So I started describing to him about my project. In two minutes he stopped me. He said, Doctor, you are a remarkable man. You don't come here to advise the health administration. You must come here to advise the entire administration. You don't talk about anything big. You talk about simple day-to-day -day things. And uh, now how it became a national policy. In 2001, uh, uh, I, they invited me to open a unit at Gampaha. That's about 20 miles from here. Came to the airport and the provincial director was there, he said, you cannot start it tomorrow. All the junior doctors are against this. Not the consultant. Anyway, following day, I spoke to them, but I couldn't move them. They were hell-bent on not starting a unit. That's not good for the people. And uh, then uh, I spoke to the director general. Now, this is another important point. From time to time, our successive governments brought in clin clinicians from outright uh, uh, to jumpstart our health care. Uh, I was aware of four, and with three I worked, and they supported me to the hilt, all of them. They were totally aware, came and saw my units, and, and uh, they were fully supportive. So I called him and said, these guys don't let me start the unit, and he said, Dhanapala. I think it's time we issue a national uh, circular. You are the man who knows about it. Why don't you write the circular? So I wrote the first circular, and it was issued in uh, 2001, uh, 2001, uh, uh, I don't know, April, maybe. Anyway, uh, is that my time? Yeah, that's your time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I want to show you how I open a unit. Uh, 
okay there are two ways of doing it the proper way and less than the proper way i guess you know i opted for the second route okay because i have not never done anything properly only there were imperfections and uh, i had some knowledge and i was getting better and whenever an opportunity presented i made use of that now this uh, to give an example uh, this negambo uh, my good friend the regional director dr padma sire and he was going to the hospital i accompanied him just to see the hospital there was no way i could start a unit and while he was attending to his work he asked me to talk to a few nurses so we have a bunch of nurses 10 to 12 and i showed a slide from other places uh, and started describing how it worked and they got really excited and one one nurse asked me so if you are going to open this when can we open this i said today how can you open today we don't have enough nurses even for the ward i said that's fine give me one nurse from each ward and we will start it immediately after the morning rounds and that's how we started uh, and uh, when am i uh, start a unit i i don't give orders and go and sit down somewhere i join them i'm with them helping them like to start an iv place ekg gig so i was part of the team and they felt it and uh, i never asked them uh, to do something that i couldn't do i always emphasize on kindness preparedness and cleanliness <laughs> um. <laughs> okay over the years i formulated some emergency medicine rules uh, they didn't come all together started with about 4 or 5 and gradually ended up in about 23 number 1 forget about isis forget about global warming just smile <laughs> sing a song when you come to the world okay number 2 don't try to be perfect if you are a perfect person i can't handle you this is not the place for you and control the pain by whatever the means i don't want to know what the diagnosis but no one should be in pain uh, right or wrong i totally discourage investigation i'm telling you right or wrong talk to the patient examine the patient come up with a tentative diagnosis so they know that so when they work with me they didn't investigate because i don't even look at them and other thing is about giving medications now i didn't say this okay uh, use medications sparingly only the needed medications now i i am wondering if i use more than 10 or 15 kinds of medications all these years in the emergency unit i'm not talking about the family medicine or anything like that but emergency unit few medications only i used this an important one i'll come to that later uh, with every patient you have to think uh, that can i treat this patient on an outpatient basis uh, have fun enjoy the work this is not the end of the world you are not going to a funeral home so laugh laugh from die friend okay not from the throat uh, and love the work and love the people around you and love the, the patients who come to you to get better academic recognition is chula here oh, i don't see him anyway the credit goes to him uh, he also went through a lot of difficulties the future i want to say uh, i think i have a few more minutes uh, we have a very bright future honestly honestly we have our health care is not that bad we have an enviable infrastructure you go to a tiny place in jungle there's a doctor there government appointed doctor okay. we have all the resources and and the expertise all we need is a fine tuning not much uh, this cannot happen without an all all inclusive inclusive national forum all the stakeholders including the patient the public should be there uh, it is it's it's not merely o- opening a unit it's not uh, introducing emergency medicine to me it's bigger than that we are we are changing a culture a generational change i have seen that you saw that admissions will drop at least by 75% then the wards will slowly dry up and we 
we, we have to uh, get you to that and uh, uh, accept it rather than fighting it. It's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen, whether you like it or not. And it's a cultural change from ward culture to an outpatient culture. Um, this change will not happen without some turbulence. Okay? There is going to be some resistance. Now, for these young doctors who are graduating, uh, finishing this uh, course, uh, you, have, you have to face this turbulence because you are not getting into an established path. You have to establish the path for the future generations. Now, let me finish up with a quote from, uh, I don't know him, I think he's a professor at uh, Emory University. Uh, speak for those with no voice. Touch those who are untouchable. Listen to those who can only whisper. And help those with nowhere to go. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Danapal Rodrigo, for the excellent presentation. Uh, we can take up a couple of questions, and uh, I understand we have a panel discussion at the end of the session, so we can probably raise any more questions during that session as well. So we'll take up one or two questions. We have two minutes left. Good morning. I'm Halit uh, from Afghanistan, but practicing in Netherlands. Uh -huh. How long the patient was staying in your units? Uh, oh. We will not call it emergency department. Yeah. Preliminary. Four, yeah. Four hours. Four hours. Generally, okay. If we, are, if we know that we are going to decide the guy, we might keep him a little long. Generally, four hours. No more questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Danapala. Thank, Thank you, Dr.